Okay. Well, um, since I started doing uh, research in mathematics uh, as a graduate student, uh, partially ordered sets or post sets have been one of my main interests. So I thought I would uh, today talk about uh, some of them that I have found uh, especially interesting, which are connected with uh, many other areas of mathematics and you know, suggest all kinds of uh, further questions and generalizations. So uh, I'll begin with the uh, partition lattice because this is the first post set that I was uh, exposed to. Um, I was reading a paper of uh, Robert McLeese. This was, I think, when I was a second year uh, graduate student around 1967. And he... Uh, proved some formula using uh, the Mobius function of the uh, partition lattice, the lattice of partitions of the set one up to n ordered by refinement. Here's an example uh, you know, for uh, n equals four, where I've omitted the one element or singleton blocks uh, from the notation. So McLeese actually could have easily proved his formula without this tool of Mobius inversion, but um, I guess it was fortuitous for me that he did it because this is how I found out about the work of Giancarlo Rota on uh, partially ordered sets and got me started in this area. So uh, let me say a few uh, quickly, you know, say a few of the uh, nice properties of this post set, which most of this I was not aware of, uh, you know, at the time. I started working in this area, but the one that McLeese used was that the Mobius function, I assume you know the definition of the Mobius function of a post set from the bottom element to the top element is a minus one to the n minus one times n minus one factorial. Even uh, more generally, the characteristic polynomial of this post set pi n, here's the uh, definition. A polynomial whose coefficients are sums of Mobius function values. It's this very nice form, q minus one, q minus two, q minus n plus one. So uh, one question you can ask is what is going on uh, that explains uh, such a nice factorization? Well, uh, one answer is given by the connection with the uh, theory of hyperplane arrangements. Pi n is the intersection lattice of the braid arrangement Bn. And so uh, this uh, sorry, is the first uh, step in this understanding this huge subject of uh, hyperplane arrangements. Now, uh, the arrangement Bn is the graphical arrangement of the complete graph Kn. So by the general you know, theory of hyperplane arrangements and graphical arrangements, Q times this characteristic polynomial will be the chromatic polynomial of Kn. So that's one explanation of the uh, factorization because the chromatic polynomial of Kn is um, you know, trivially seen to be this polynomial times Q. This factor of Q arises because the uh, braid arrangement has dimension n minus one, but it's embedded in dimension n. Now, purely lattice theoretically, uh, you can explain the factorization of the uh, <coughs> characteristic polynomial because the uh, pi n is a super solvable arrangement. So this, uh, was the beginning or the first example in this theory of super solvability and many uh, generalizations. Now, a very, another very nice uh, feature of the partition lattice, which again is an introduction to the, another huge subject, is that the uh, symmetric group Sn, well, it acts on the lattice pi n, uh, obviously by interchanging the elements of the set one up to n, 
but by muting those elements. So it's going to act on the top homology of the order complex of pi n with the zero and one removed. The order complex is just the simplicial complex of chains. The faces are the chains of this poset. And the theorem is that the action is isomorphic, essentially, well, to the action of Sn on the multilinear part of the free Lie algebra Lie n, or well, up to a uh, twist by the sine character. So uh, this uh, you know shows the this poset pi n uh, has deep connections with representation theory and Lie algebras, and there's also the beginnings of this whole subject of uh, connections with uh, algebra and representation theory. Here's a uh, little uh, figure that illustrates the super solvability property of pi n. These blue vertices form a modular maximal chain. That means that this chain together with any other chain, the sublattice they generate is distributed. Moreover, pi n is an upper semi-modular lattice, or even more strongly a geometric lattice. And that means that uh, as we go up this chain, and look how many atoms, new atoms we pick up by you know, underneath the elements of the chain. So when we go to here to here, we pick up this one new element. At the second step, we're underneath these two new elements. And at the last step, we pick up three new atoms that are underneath this top element. We look at the number of new elements picked up at each step, one, two, and three, and those will be the roots of the characters to polymer. Okay, so that explains why pi n is such an interesting uh, poset form. It's really the gateway to many other uh, areas. Now, a simpler uh, poset um, that, but also of fundamental importance and also illustrates many uh, further uh, deep things one can do with uh, partially ordered sets. Just the Boolean algebra Bn, all subsets of the set one up to n ordered by uh, inclusion. So here's our Boolean algebra B3. Now, uh, Bn is a very nice example of the use of flag F vectors and H vectors. So let's say P is any graded poset of rank N with a zero and one and a rank function rho. We let S be any subset of one up to N minus one. So the flag f vector of p is the function alpha p uh, defined on subsets of bracket n minus one. Its value at s is the number of chains in p who, such that the ranks of its elements are just the elements of s. So we're looking at what are called rank selected chains. We're counting chains whose elements have specified ranks. If uh, S was all of one up to N minus one, then we would be counting the number of maximal chain in our poset P. The flag H vector of uh, P is this function beta P, which is defined by a kind of inclusion, exclusion, a sum uh, involving alphas. We can invert this sum and get an equivalent uh, definition that alpha p of s is a sum of t and s beta p of t. So uh, when I was a graduate student, I came up with these definitions. I, I didn't have this terminology yet. But I did many, many computations. And here is an example of one applied to the Boolean algebra before. So our sets S go from empty to one, two, three. 
here are the values of alpha of S. For instance, we get 24 here because there's 24 maximal chains in the Boolean algebra B4. And these are with the values of the flag H vector beta. So you can see uh, from looking at this, all kinds of very suggestive numbers. For one thing, they're non-negative, which is not obvious from the definition. And there's a lot of symmetry here. Well, what's especially interesting here is the non-negativity. Um, and one way of explaining it is by uh, edge labeling the Boolean algebra. Now, this is the beginning of the theory of edge labelings of posets. For Boolean algebras, it's very simple how we should do this. We have an edge from S to S, we're picking up a new element odd. These are the edges of the Hasse diagram. And we will label this edge by odd, a new element that we needed to adjoin to get from S to the top element of the edge. And like, so the blue numbers are the elements of the poset and the black numbers are the edge labels. Going from here to here, we uh, picked up the element three. So we label this edge by three. And the crucial property, which uh, is obvious in the case of this edge labeling, is that every interval from S to T, from any element to any element above it, has a unique weakly increasing saturated chain. As we read the edge labels uh, on a saturated chain, there's a unique chain where the labels weakly increase. Well, here they're going to actually be strictly increasing because uh, the, the edge la the chain labels are all have, have this, the chains are all labeled by distinct integers. But for instance, from here to here, uh, we have two saturated chain labels: two, three, and three, two, and there's a unique increasing one. Well, it's obvious for the uh, Boolean algebra because there's a unique way to add the new elements we need to get from here to here that are increasing. We just add the elements in increasing order. Now, this property um, suffices uh, to prove the following theorem, really a simple argument, that once we have this kind of edge labeling, then we have an interpretation of beta, uh, the flag H vector. Well, for the Boolean algebra, it would be its value at S is equal to the number of maximal chains whose labels, A1, A2, up to, I think this really should be AN minus one, from bottom to top, have to sense that S. So the number of maximal chains whose labels have the property that S is the set of all I, such that AI is greater than AI plus one. Well, for the Boolean algebra, the labels of the maximal chains are just the permutations, one up to N. There's all ways that we can uh, add the elements one at a time to get from the empty set to the full set, one up to N. One up to N. So we as a corollary, we get the nice combinatorial interpretation of the flag H vector, the BN. Its value at S is the number of L permutations in SN of the sense set S. So again, this introduces this huge area of labeling, edge labelings, connections with the sense sets of permutations. You know, how, how much can we generalize this result? It's the first glimpse of the, this whole theory, uh, theory of flag vectors, edge labelings, lexicographic shellability, token. In fact, the first beginnings of the first systematic development of topological combinatorics. So that's one reason why BN is one of my favorite posets. Another uh, reason is a uh, that it uh, is the well, 
original example of the Sperner property. So we have any finite graded poset of rank n, which is going to have be divided into these disjoint ranks p0 up to pn. We'll define an antechain of p to be a subset for which no two elements are comparable. So in particular, each pi is an antechain. <clears throat> There's a lot of interest in what is the size of the largest antechain of a poset, say of a finite poset. And the simplest case would be for a graded poset if the maximum antechain size is just the maximum level, the maximum cardinality of pi. So, uh, POSET has this property, we'll say that it has the Sperner property. And Sperner's famous 1927 theorem, well, of course, he didn't uh, state it this way, but it's saying that the Boolean algebra has the Sperner property. Now, there's many proofs of this, but the one uh, that I like especially because, uh, well, it's uh, algebraic proof and it uh, can we generalized uh, quite a bit is a linear algebra proof. And uh, this goes uh, as follows. I'm not going to prove any why this works. I'll just state out what it says. We have our finite graded poset. QPI will be the vector space of all linear combinations of elements of PI. Well, say a linear transformation from QPI to QPI plus one, call it UI, is an order raising operator. If it takes an element T and PI to a linear combination of elements that are bigger than P and PI plus one, bigger than T. So it's a linear combination of elements that cover T. And the theorem, which is the key to the linear algebraic method says that if for some j ui is injected for i less than j and surjective for i greater than j, then p had the Sperner property. So we only have, oh, yeah, so we only have to check this linear algebra property, injectivity and surjectivity uh, for certain linear transformations. Of course, really the difficult part usually how to define ui uh, correctly. For uh, the Boolean algebra, we make what you might say is the simplest possible definition. If s is a j element set, then u of s is just defined to be the sum of all j plus one element sets that contain s. And it's a nice exercise in linear algebra to show that it has the proper injectivity and surjectivity properties. So that's one way to prove the NS burning. And not the simplest way, but one that can be generalized quite a bit. So that's why I like BN. Now an another class of finite posets that I really like is the weak Brouhaha order of the symmetric group, but also the strong order, but I only have time to talk about the weak order, which is especially nice uh, related to my uh, interests, common for interests. So uh, if, let's say we have a permutation W A1 up to A N and S N. An inversion of W, uh, we think of as a pair, well, J I, uh, such that oh, uh, a well uh, a j is uh, strictly less than a i. It's a pair of elements that's out of order. The inversion set will be the set of all these pairs a j a i, such that i is less than j and a i is greater than a j. The length of a permutation l w is a number of inversions size of the inversion set, IW. I'm sure you should, you should know the definition of an adjacent transposition, a permutation that 
transposes i and i plus one and fixes all the other elements. The weak order WSN, the partial ordering on SN will we say that permutation V covers you if for some I V is obtained by applying an adjacent uh, transposition to U that increases the length by one. Really, it's a, a changing two consecutive elements of U that are in order. Another way of defining of equivalent definition is saying that U is less than V for any U and V if the inversion set of U is strictly contained in the inversion set of V. This is a weak order on uh, S4. This is not exactly the most elegant way of drawing it, but, it, but it's correct. For instance, uh, there's only one way to exchange two consecutive elements here that are in order. We exchange one and four. So we go up to two, four, one, three. Well, one reason the weak order is interesting is it's connecting with reduced decompositions of permutations. If W is a permutation of length P, so it has P uh, inversions, a reduced decomposition of W is a P tuple of positive integers such that W is the product SC1 up to SCP. We get it by interchanging consecutive elements P times. It's the minimum possible. R of W is a number of reduced decompositions of W. Well, uh, for uh, W in the weak order, we can let E of W be the number of saturated chains from the zero element, the identity permutation, the W in SN. In general, for any post set with the zero, I'm going to let E of an element be the number of saturated chains from zero to that element. A very uh, important function on posets. Well, it's an easy observation that E of W is just the number of reduced decompositions of W. The saturated chain is just a way of, uh, as we go up the saturated chain, we're just at each step um, make, applying an adjacent transposition that increases the length by one. So this connects the weak order with a theory of reduced decompositions of permutations, also, which in turn are connected with stable Schubert polynomials, quiver varieties, and all kinds of other subjects. In particular, uh, one of the first uh, applications of uh, this connection was uh, this theorem for the number of reduced decompositions of um, the longest permutation n, n minus one down to one. It has just this simple product formula. Well, this looks very mysterious if you've never seen it before. <laughs> it's the hook length formula for the number of uh, standard Young tableau of the staircase shape n minus one, n minus two down to one. And they come into the picture because of this connection with a stable super element. So I won't go into any further details, but this just indicates why uh, the weak order is uh, such a nice poset. It has all these connections with other areas and lets you prove these, in this case, a pure enumeration theorem using all this fancy uh, algebraic machinery. Now, another uh, game that we can play with the weak order of SN is uh, asking whether it has the Sperner property. And uh, now this was a conjecture for quite a while. And uh, two recent proofs, well, five years ago, were given using the linear algebraic method. Uh, the first proof by Getz and Gao they constructed a 
It's known as an SL2 represent well, a representation of the Lie algebra SL2 on the this vector space whose basis is the symmetric group SN. Now it turns out the SL2 representation is sufficient well, to uh, give you this order raising operator U that we need to prove the Sperner property. And this group of four people also use the linear algebraic method, but they uh, instructed the uh, order raising operator by looking at a certain differential operator acting on Schubert polynomials. So uh, another reason why uh, the weak order on SN is such a nice post set. Uh, there's a lot of open problems connected with this result. For instance, it's not known whether the weak order of the hyperoctahedral group has a Schrodinger product. We can see if we try to extend either of these two techniques. Also, it can win. Actually, well, you have a more combinatorial proof. Of no anti chain of this poson is bigger than the biggest level, which is the middle level. Okay, now let's look at a very simple poset. I call it the Pascal poset because it's related to Pascal's triangle. I only uh, mention this poset, well, because uh, it suggests thing, doing similar uh, things with uh, other posets. This poset is just the direct product of two chains, the non, two copies of the non-negative uh, integers with the usual linear order. It's an infinite poset. With a, it's graded. The rank function of a pair ij is just the sum i plus j. If eij is the number of saturated chains from the bottom element 0, 0 to element ij, then uh, Eij is clearly the binomial coefficient i plus j, choose i. If we label the element ij with Eij, then we're just getting Pascal's triangle, which looks like this. I, well, I'm drawing it, you might say, with the poset upside down with the bottom element at the top, because this is the usual way of drawing Pascal's triangle. We get the Pascal recurrence relation because like this six is three plus three because every maximal chain from here, and every saturated chain from here to here either goes through here or through here, but not both. So there's all kinds of uh, things we can do with binomial coefficients in the world. We can occupy books with the subject. Um, so we can, you know, see which one of them carry over nicely to any infinite graded poset. One question in particular are the sums of the rth powers of the uh, binomial coefficients at level k, or right k. That is the sum of n choose k to the r, k equals zero to n. We can call this FR of n. Of course, F0 of n, just the number of elements of rank n is n plus one, the linear function of n. There's, when you look at lots of further examples, there seems to be a big difference between whether and what happens when this number is small, like a linear rate of growth, and large, like an exponential rate of growth. F1 of n, the sum of the binomial coefficients n choose k, of course, it's at 2 to the n. And uh, it has an L, a rational generating function. For r equals 2, 
Well, we have the famous identity part, especially the case of the Vandermond convolution. It's two n choose n. Now the generating function is algebraic, but not rational. When we go to R equals three, there's no really simple formula for this sum, but the generating function is definite, not algebraic. So we can ask these questions for any poset. And uh, uh, often we get some very interesting uh, results. So let's look at another very nice infinite graded poset, Young's lattice. Just integer partitions ordered by diagram containment. So here I've shown it up to rank five with the Young diagrams of the partitions and the partial ordering is by the containment of diagrams or equivalently Lambda is lesser than or equal to mu if lambda i is lesser than or equal to mu i. Lambda i is the ith part of lambda. Well, well most of you probably know this poset has a lot of uh, nice properties. If we put in these numbers, e lambda, the number of saturated chains from the empty set to lambda, so here's what they look like. We will call E lambda as in this or Young's lattice uh, is uh, usually denoted F lambda. And some of the properties of Young's lattice. Well, it's a distributive lattice. It's the lattice of finite order ideals of the Pascal lattice n cross n. Uh, we can look at again take the Elements number the elements well the, the the numbers f lambda at rank n the sum of all partitions of n f lambda squared that's the nicest exponent r equals two well except for r equals zero where we'll get the number of partitions of n for r equals two we'll just get n factorial for just the sum of the f lambdas we'll get the number of um, involutions in S n which has a nice uh, generating exponential generating function, e to the x plus x squared over two. We can count other paths. We can you know, describe these numbers, uh, sum of f lambda squared and f lambda as counting certain paths in the Hasse diagram. We can count many other kinds of paths, such as the number of paths, two n steps in the Hasse diagram from zero to zero. These kinds of paths where we can add squares or remove squares are called oscillating tableau. And the number from zero to zero of length two n is just two n minus one semi-factorial. One times three times five up to two n minus one. Now all of these three last properties can be explained purely, you know, lattice theoretically by saying that y is a differential poset. Well, I won't define that, but that gets you into this theory of differential posets. And differential posets can be used to prove many other chain counting properties in Young's labs. But as many of you know, these properties can also be explained uh, using representation theory. One way of looking at this is to say that, well, first, let me define a Bratteli diagram of any sequence of finite dimensional semi-simple algebras, say over a field. The element, so we're given the sequence of semi-simple algebras. They're ordered by strict containment. The elements of rank N are indexed by the irreducible representations of A M. This uh, symbol is a fractur A. Mm -hmm. And uh, in general, these posets have, are, are edge weighted. Uh, 
the edges of the Hasse diagram are weighted. An edge from uh, element T of rank N minus one to an element U of rank N is weighted by the non-negative integer M that when we restrict the irreducible representation corresponding to U to the one corresponding to T, it has multiplicity M. It'll restrict, if we look at the, I mean, if we look at the number of copies of VT, the multiplicity of the irreducible representation VT will be will have multiplicity M. So if M is zero, we just don't draw the edge. And if M is one, we just omit the label one. So for uh, Young's lattice, we get the Bratteli diagram of the group algebras of S and These restrictions are all multiplicity free. So there's no uh, edge uh, lab labeling. This is really uh, uh, Pierre's rule, well, for just the shape, the single shape of one, for just the shape consisting of one square. How you restrict an irreducible representation in SM to SM minus one. I mean, Vaughn Jones has shown that any graded uh, post set and, uh, with uh, finitely many elements of each rank is the Bratelli, Bratelli diagram of a sequence of uh, uh, semi simple algebras. Okay, so um, this gives a connection with with Young's lattice and representation theory, these numbers F lambda are the dimensions of the irreducible representations of the symmetric group that follows immediately from the theory of Bratelli diagrams. Now, let me finish up with uh, two posets that are related to the Fibonacci numbers, which I, uh, which I like, whose properties I like. They're both, uh, well, so I'll call this Fibonacci fun. The first lattice is just the, which I call the Fibonacci distributor lattice, FDL, has a very simple definition. The finite order ideals of this comb poset. This diagram should make it obvious what the comb is. We have this chain, zero, one, two, et cetera and a new element covering each element of the chain. Here's what the first few levels of FDL look like. You can think of it this way. Uh, we're piling up Julian algebras of larger and larger size, beginning with levels increasing by one each time. So here's the Boolean algebra B1. Here's B2, starting at level uh, one, then we take an atom of B2 and, st and stick on the, the Boolean algebra B3. Then we take an atom of B3 and adjoin to it Boolean algebra B4, etc. So it'll look like, it looks like this. My second Fibonacci different, uh, uh, Fibonacci lattice, or, or is uh, what I call the Fibonacci differential poset Z. It'll be a differential poset. It's defined by reflection extension. Once we build it up to level N, we then reflect level N minus one, the Hasse diagram of level N minus one through level N, and then we adjoin one new element covering each element of level N. So we start with a single point. There's nothing to reflect from below. So we just add one new element to get to level one. Now we're gonna reflect from level zero through level one up to level two. And then we'll add one new element to each element of level one. So we got this. I draw it this way. I'll draw the reflection um, 
slant that showed the symmetry of this post hat. It has this uh, automorphism of order two. So we reflect up to here, and then we add one new element. Now we reflect level one up, up to level three. That'll give us this in blue, and then we add one new element above each element of level one in magenta. Now we reflect the blue edges and extend the uh, magenta edges and continue. Another graded poset whose number of elements at rank n is a Fibonacci number. And both for both of these Fibonacci lattices, it's easy to see why we get this Fibonacci number of uh, elements at rank n. Now, V happens to be the Bratteli diagram of this very interesting sequence of algebras called Okada algebras. I won't define them here, but they're given by very by simple uh, generators and relations. This suggests is FDL, the Fibonacci distributive lattice, also a Bratteli diagram of a nice sequence of algebras. By this result of Jones, it always will be the Bratteli diagram of some sequence of algebras. But we would like to have some kind of common material definition of it, or a nice definition in terms of generators or relations, something like that. Now let's look at um, the uh, numbers ET for FDL and for Z for these two Fibonacci distributive lattices. That is, for each element T, I look at the number of saturated chain from zero to T. Here's what they look like for Fibonacci and for Z, the, 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 the differential one. Well, you'll notice one sort of amazing coincidence. The numbers at level N are the same as multi Like There's one eight here and there's one eight here. Although the intervals, like, like from this bottom to this eight and from this, oops, to uh, from this eight to this eight, completely different interval structure. Well, this is a theorem that we, that this is always true. There's a nice, that this is a nice definition, explicit definition of a rank preserving bijection free from FDL to Z that preserves this number E of T, the number of saturated chain from the empty or from the bottom element of T. Moreover, well, since we get these, the E of T's are the same, uh, these numbers are, this theorem will be true for either Z or FDL. The sum of the E of T squares is n factorial, and the sum of the E of T's is the number of involutions in SN, just like Young's lattice. Well, this is uh, immediately clear from the fact that um, Z is a differential uh, lattice, but it's also true for the Fibonacci for FDL, but not clear. And in fact, uh, Ed Bender a long time ago came up with a Shenstead like proof of these theorems for FDL. The theory of differential postsets will give you a Shenstead like proof of this, of these results for uh, Z, the Fibonacci differential lattice. Now, what's even more amazing is not only does uh, this map phi preserve the number of max maximal chains or saturated chains in the interval from zero to uh, T, it preserves the number of chains of any length. Now, the proof I have of this result 
is an inelegant reduction argument. So um, it would be uh, quite interesting to find the conceptual proof of this result, a simpler proof of what's really going on between uh, these two uh, lattices that they have this amazing uh, common property. Um, and can this uh, be generalized, this relationship between these two uh, lattices? Okay, so I, that gives you a good idea of uh, why I am so interested in partially ordered sets and the ones in particular that um, uh, have interested me. And I suggest many further directions of uh, work. So we've come to my final slide. Um, but if I had more time, in fact, uh, which I don't have, I do have an encore whose title is Further Fibonacci Fund. There's another um, ladder, a posent. Actually, it's not a ladder, it's a graded posent that's connected with Fibonacci numbers that has lots of amazing properties. And I stuck this, well, you can see this on the posted version of these slides on my uh, uh, web page. Thank you for listening.